Today we're going to talk about how we can use particulate models to represent different chemical and physical processes. For example, we have a chemical reaction here where we have methane reacting with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. The illustrators of this diagram have used space-filling models to represent the molecules. There are several different ways in which you can use particulate diagrams, but regardless of how you do them, there's a general set of rules that you should follow so that your diagrams reflect what's really going on. Let's talk about how to represent the different states of matter. Solid particles should be in close contact with each other in a way that maximizes attractions and minimizes repulsions. When you're looking at nonpolar molecules, this can be pretty straightforward. If you're looking at ionic solids, you're going to want to alternate positive and negative charges. And if you're working with polar molecules, you're going to want to arrange them in such a way that partial negative charges are oriented towards partial positive charges. When you are representing solids, don't forget the effect of gravity. Unless you're on the International Space Station, solids will usually be drawn to the bottom of the container. Liquid particles should be close to each other or touch each other, but there should be some disorder. Again, any dipoles or charges should be oriented to properly show attractions and repulsions. With gas particles, these should spread out all around the container to fill the space. Sometimes arrows are included to represent temperature, especially if you're looking at things like kinetic molecular theory. Now let's talk about aqueous solutions. When we're drawing particle diagrams of solutions, sometimes the water is included, but sometimes it isn't. If water is shown and there are ions, it's important to make sure that the partial positive ends of the water molecule are facing the negative ions and that the partial negative end of the water molecule is facing the positive ion. Now let's talk about particle size. For some substances, like ions, it can be important to show relative sizes of the particles. For example, in this picture, the chloride anion is drawn larger than the sodium cation, and this appropriately reflects the size difference in the ionic radii. We also want to pay a lot of attention to size of particles when we're discussing alloys. For alloys, the structure should indicate the type of alloy, if it's substitution or interstitial, and the relative sizes of the particles. For example, for an interstitial alloy, your interstitial particles are going to be very small. Precipitates are generally shown as particles or clumps at the bottom of the container, as in this picture. This is another time where we don't want to forget about gravity. In some cases, air fluid boundaries may also be shown. Also pay attention to what breaks up when you dissolve it and what doesn't. Many ionic compounds will dissociate or break apart into their ions when you put them in water. This is especially the case with compounds that contain lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium, and nitrate, as well as our strong acids and bases, which we will talk about at a future time. Covalent compounds, however, do not break up when you dissolve them. So if you are drawing solutions involving covalent compounds, you need to make sure that you're keeping the molecules intact. Covalent compounds can, of course, break up or rearrange if they're undergoing chemical reactions. When you're drawing particle diagrams, it's important to take into account things like amount and molarity. For example, because of the law of conservation of mass, atoms must be present in the same amounts on each side. Even if they've been rearranged into molecules, count them. Make sure this is happening when you do your particle diagrams. It's also important to use the relative numbers of molecules or particles when you're representing reactions. Here's an example of a fermentation reaction where glucose breaks down into alcohol and carbon dioxide. We can see we have one mole of glucose, and it decomposes to form two moles of alcohol and two moles of carbon dioxide. If you're representing dilutions, 
The molarity should also be consistent. For example, say we have equal volumes of a 1 molar solution and a 0.5 molar solution. If we're drawing a particle diagram, we need to make sure that the 0.5 molar solution has half the number of particles as the 1.0 molar solution. When you're drawing particle diagrams that include different types of atoms, it's important to make sure you use distinct shapes or colors to denote different types of atoms or ions. Also, include a key to indicate which shape or color represents which atom. When you're making particle diagrams, also don't forget the charges. Ions should have charges on them. Dipoles should have partial positive and partial negative charges on them, especially if you're trying to show intermolecular forces. They must also be properly aligned to maximize attraction and minimize repulsion. In summary, balanced chemical equations in their various forms can be translated into symbolic particulate representations. And there are some rules that should be followed to make sure that your particle diagram most accurately reflects what is really going on.